Welcome to the Mike Abadir Show. You'll want to sit tight this hour as host Mike Abadir and co-host Gino Bacola talk to the experts, celebrities, and figures from the worlds of sports and business of sports. We cover the NFL, baseball, basketball, soccer, and horse racing, so we have all of the bases covered. Now, we just need your participation. Here is your host, Mike Abadir. Welcome to the Mike Abadir Show. This is your host, Mike Abadir, and we have an action-packed filled episode for you today. We're happy to be joined by an absolutely fantastic guest to break down the MLB playoffs. And we're just going to bring him right in because we're limited on time and there's a lot of topics to discuss. So our first guest comes from an amazing baseball family. He's a World Series winner in 2009 with the New York Yankees. He's a baseball TV analyst for the Dodgers baseball broadcast on Access Sportsnet LA. I'm talking about the one and only Jerry Hairston Jr. Jerry, good morning. How are you? My good morning. Hey, that's quite an introduction right there. I, I like that. <laughs> you know what? It could have been a lot more lengthy, man, because there's a lot of substance to your career. You've done a lot of things, and there's so much to talk about, but we're just thrilled to have you on board. How's it going? It, it's going great, you know, and uh, thanks for having me. And I tell you what, it's the postseason's off to a, a, a thunderous start. I mean, the, the Yankees uh, Twins wild card game was nuts, and obviously last night's game between the Rockies and the D backs was crazy as well. So, uh, a lot of action. And I'm just excited that the postseason baseball is here. Yeah, and so are we. I mean, you you brought up the two wild card games. They're absolutely fantastic. You know, you watch the first inning of the Twins game, and you think that they're going to maybe upset the the Yankees and the Bronx, and the Yankees roar back, led by Aaron, uh, led by the home run charge by Judge and 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 company. And, and a stellar bullpen after they only got one-third of an inning out of their starter. And then last night's game obviously was fantastic, too. There's so many places that we can go to get things started. Let's go back to the wild card game in a moment. But let's talk about this Dodgers season because they were the number one team wins-wise with 104 wins. They got off to a 91-36 and 36 start. There was the stretch of 1-16 and 16 out of a 17-game stretch. Closed the year with a 12 out of 18 win streak run. What, what do you make of this up and down season? And obviously, when you're the number one seed, you look at it from the perspective of the entirety of the 162. But just generally yeah. speaking, observing it every day, what do you make of the entire season? Well, first of all, it was a successful season, obviously, for the Dodgers. Anytime you win 104 games in a year, you had an incredible season. That said... Nobody cares that you won 104 games. Nobody's going to care if you won 115, 16 games. Right now, it's all about postseason baseball, and I call it the real season. You know, right now, the D-backs are 1-0 in the postseason, and the Dodgers are 0-0. They have yet to play a game in the postseason. So nobody cares how many games you've won in the regular season. It's all about being focused and winning the series, winning this series and advancing. And you've got to focus on winning each game, especially at home, in a short game, short series like, like this one. You know, the Diamondbacks have been very successful against, against the Dodgers, so they're coming in very confident. They've won six in a row against the Dodgers. So they, they, they're not afraid of the Dodgers. They know what to expect uh, coming into Dodger Stadium. They're not going to be shook by the fans. They're not going to be shook by, by the moment. They're a very good ball club, and they're a confident ball club. That being said, Clayton Kershaw is the best pitcher in the world for a reason. I think he's going to make a statement in game one, he's got to win that ball game because Zach Greinke's not going for the D-backs, nor is Robbie Ray. So Clayton Kershaw, the Dodgers ace, has to make sure you give them that lead, that 1-0 lead, and pitch outstanding. I know that's a tough task because the Diamondbacks are red hot and they're playing good baseball. But I think the Dodgers uh, are up to the task. They had some ups and downs throughout the season, but that's just everybody. Everybody goes to their ups and downs. And I really believe this last week, the offense – really started to catch fire with Yasmani Grandal, Austin Barnes. Uh, Corey Seager really started to swing the bat well. In order to advance, you have to be firing on all cylinders, both from the pitching side, bullpen, and the offensive side of the ball. So you got to play great baseball if you want to exa- advance. You know, and I don't want to dwell too much on that uh, slumping period of games there because it was only, you know, like I said, 17 games out of an entire 162. 
But my question for you is, what do you think the slump was due to? Was it a lapse in focus due to having such a big lead? Was it, you know, some knickknack injuries? Um, and, and how did Dave Roberts keep his cool and the team still focused on the task at hand? Well, it wasn't because of a lack of focus. Focus. They, they were focused every single day. I, I go to the stadium every once in a while, and I see them prepare. They're a well-prepared group. Now, a couple guys were banged up. Uh, Cody Bellinger was on the deal uh, for 10 days during that stretch. Corey Seager has been banged up the last couple of months. Justin Turner as well. So there is a variety of things that cause uh, that little slide. But the main thing is they weren't playing good baseball. They weren't pitching well. Their defense wasn't as good. They weren't hitting. I think they were at that point in that two- or three-week stretch, they were dead last in hitting. Uh, so when you don't pitch well and you don't hit, guess what? You're not going to win very, very many games. So the Dodgers made no, ex- no excuses. Uh, I love that they got hit around a little bit. I love that they got knocked down because it kind of tests your resolve a little bit. If they would have cruised to 117, 120 wins, then they would have strolled down in the, pl- the end of the postseason and then got knocked in the mouth. Then you don't know how they would react. Now they've got knocked down a bit. They got a little chip on their shoulder. They know the Arizona Diamondbacks are coming to get them. And they better be prepared because the D-backs are a very good team. They got power. They got, they got hitting. And they don't strike out a whole lot. They put pressure on the defense. Uh, and, and they pitch well. So it should be a, a very entertaining series. Well, speaking of the pitching, what does it do to the rotation? What's Lavulo going to have to do now that Grinky and Ray aren't available in game one? Did, is, that a, is that a victory for the Dodgers before the series even started, do you think? It is. Anytime you – and there's no knock on Taiwan Walker. I think he's going to be an incredible pitcher uh, in years to come. Uh, he's a competitor, uh, one of the best athletes uh, that takes the mound. He was, uh, I believe, was all area, all state basketball player in the state of California, an uh, incredible athlete, uh, and he's a competitor. I've seen him take the mound at Dodger Stadium, and he's pitched extremely well. But he And they gave up a lot to get him, too, in Segura. They did. They gave up a lot to get him, yep. and he's got that talent. But that being said, you have your ace on the mound in Clayton Kershaw. If I'm the offense, hey, we got to get him three or four runs early. Let him pitch with a lead. Usually aces know how to pitch with a lead. So you got to make sure you put the pressure on the young Taiwan Walker. Uh, if he's a little wild, a little erratic, don't help him out. If he's going to give a free pass as we have a walk, take your walks. Uh, make sure you execute at the plate and score some runs early and put pressure on that young pitcher. Uh, so you got to make sure you take care of business at home, especially game one, when neither Robbie Ray or Zach Greinke is taking them out. Yeah, and I'm kind of thinking that if the Dodgers can have a patient approach and work the counts and you know try to knock Walker out of the game early, I think if there's a weakness with the Diamondbacks, it's their bullpen. I mean, I know Rodney had a pretty good season, but is he a trustworthy closer to nail the game at the end of the game, uh, you know, night in, night out, especially in the postseason? Well, he, uh, Rodney's been a tremendous closer in this league for a long time. That said, he's been pitching a long time. I think we're about the same age. I think he's 40 years of age, and I'm at the house, and he's still pitching, pitching in the business <laughs> and being very successful. So I'm not going to knock him too much. But, you know, he, he does remember getting knocked around at Dodger Stadium. So the bullpen, if there is an Achilles heel of the Diamondbacks, it has been that bullpen. So it's very, very important that the Dodgers get to that bullpen early especially with that wild card game. A lot, of, a lot of the relievers were used in that wild card game. So if you get these, get, get these guys using a bullpen early in game one, game two, it could only benefit the Dodgers. Agreed. And, you know, you're talking about bullpen usage and managerial decisions and things of that nature. I got to tell you, Dave Roberts in the last postseason managed one of the most magnificent performances that I've seen from a manager in a long time for some for a team that didn't necessarily win at all. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. he was so tremendous yeah. last postseason, carried into this year and led the team to the best record in baseball. Young manager, didn't have you know managerial experience uh, to speak of. What makes Dave Roberts tick and succeed at this level? Well, first of all, it's a couple things. Uh, his, his high baseball IQ understanding the game. Yeah, he was a starter for many years as an outfielder in the biggest, but he also was that fourth outfielder. So he got a chance to kind of sit the bench, 
observe the game from the dugout, look at his various managers, uh, how they how they operated. You know, he, he played under Terry Francona. I believe he, he played under Grady Little, Grady Little here in, in, with the Dodgers. Uh, so he, he had the tutelage of Bud Black when he was in San Diego. So he played under or was under a really good managers, and he's very intelligent. Uh, and also, he knows how to communicate. He's a young manager. He understands what is not just what goes on on the field, but also what goes on off the field with social media, Instagram, Twitter. He is well in touch with the young athletes, so he has the trust from all his players, whether it's the veteran guys or that or those rookies. So no matter what decisions he decides to make uh, on and off the field, he has complete trust uh, of all his players and. You know, Dave Roberts and his staff work extremely hard, and they're very well prepared. I'm there sometimes 1 o'clock with my son, so we allow him to play on the field with, with, with some of the kids, and I see these guys working on the field or off the field, getting guys prepared for just that night's task. So these guys are extremely well prepared, and I think that's what caused them to be successful. No, that makes a lot of sense. And obviously, there's a lot of preparation when it comes into managing at the highest level in the best professional baseball league on the planet. Let me ask you, when the Dodgers and Mattingly parted ways, was it more so that they felt that the ceiling under Mattingly kind of had been been reached and that there was maybe a new voice that needed to be heard if they were to get to that next level? You know what? I think it was a mutual thing. You know, Don Mattingly felt that um, he needed a change of scenery, and he thought that the, the players here with the Dodgers needed a, a, a new voice. And I think it was best for both worlds. You know, Don Mattingly signed a, a lucrative deal with the Miami Marlins. He got a chance to take up a, a young team, and he's trying to mold that young team with Giancarlo Stanton, D. Gordon, Chris Yelich, and, and really build that franchise. And now Derek Jeter's the owner. And him and Derek are extremely tight, and they'll be on the same page, and that will benefit him. But as for the Dodgers, I, I think they need that new voice. You know, that, that little bit of a younger manager to kind of light a little bit more of a fire uh, under, under them to kind of challenge guys like a Yasso Puig uh, to play a, a little better, play, play a little bit more under control. And look what Yasso Puig has done this season. I mean, he has taken off on the field both defensively and offensively. So sometimes that new voice, uh, definitely uh, will help, uh, you know, help the, the current team. You know, you mentioned Yasiel Puig. He seems to be really focused on baseball, and he has not made any headlines, although in my opinion, a lot of them were very overblown and were headlines for, you know, kind of the wrong reasons. But yeah. nonetheless, is it, is it just that he's now more comfortable playing baseball in the United States in another country? He's kind of now hitting his stride. Is that what you think has led to his, you know, uh, more consistency, if you will, especially since his demotion? Yeah, well, here's the thing. Uh, A lot of people don't realize baseball, you mentioned earlier, it's probably the hardest sport in the world to play because it's every day. Now, it's more physical to play, uh, play in the NFL, no question about it. I mean, you get beat up, physically beat up, but you play one game and then you move on to the next team. Sometimes you play a, play a team 19 times in a year. You play them three or four days in a row, so the scouting report is instant. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yep. And the adjustments Yasiel Puig has had to make at the plate, it's almost like a quarterback. You know, you got to read the defense. you got to read what the pitcher is trying to do to you. And I think it's been a huge adjustment to Yasiel Puig. He can't just throw his talent on the field like he did that first year when the league didn't know him and just perform and be all world. Now the league understands you. They understand your strengths and your weaknesses. And now they know how to exploit your weaknesses. And now he's had to really learn how to be a master at his craft at the plate. He's always been a great defensive player. But at the plate, he's really had to learn to kind of pull the reins a little bit, know when to attack, know when to kind of be a little bit patient, be a patient and, and, and take your walk. So it has been an adjustment. He's, been, he's definitely matured at the plate. And we can see... Uh, we can see in the, with, with the production. His power numbers are up. He's been really good with runners in score position. Uh, so uh, he's been fun to watch this season. You know, we've got a couple minutes before break here, but I wanted to ask you, as we're talking about Puig, I'm kind of thinking, you know, I look at him from a raw talent perspective, a five-tool type player, 
I don't think that we've seen him peak. I don't think we've seen his ceiling yet. Is 40-40 out of the realm of possibility with someone so talented? I think he definitely has the talent to do that. Uh, he's still learning to steal a base. You know, I believe he has 13 stolen bases this year. Uh, he has been ca- caught, caught stealing quite a bit. You know, there's an art to stealing bases. You know, just sure. because you're fast doesn't mean you're going to steal a base because the other team knows you're fast as well, so they're going to slice the fine and they're going to pitch out. So you got to learn your craft, you know, on the bases. And he's still learning. But without question, he has the capability of doing that. He can fly on the bases, and he got tremendous power. So the talent is there. I've seen Alfonso Soriano do it. And he is just as talented, uh, if not more, than Alfonso Soriano. Sure. And, you know, you're talking about the art of stealing bases. Obviously, Dave Roberts was involved in, in my opinion, as you know, I'm a Red Sox fan, Jerry, the most important steal in Major League history, which allowed the Red Sox to make that comeback. I know you don't want me to get fully into that, but we all know the rest yeah. is history. And, uh, and that's probably, you know, w- w- one of the, the, the key components to that championship run from a few years ago. So hopefully he can maybe impart some of that wisdom, wisdom with him, as well as maybe Davey Lopes and others who are around, are around during spring training ball and uh, work with the Puig, because I think he's got a lot of upside on the bases. And uh, he's built like a linebacker, but can, uh, can, can, he could can fly. And uh, he's a tremendous, yeah, you know, tremendous athlete. It's funny you mentioned that. You know, I have a lot of, I have some friends in the NFL, and they come and you know, I'll give them BP passes. And uh, one time, one of the NFL guys saw Yasso Puig. He's like, are you kidding me? He, he knew that he was big, but he didn't realize how huge he was. You yeah. know, he goes, he could be a defensive end. He could be a tight end. That's how big Yasso Puig is. And he is built like a football player. But, but playing Amazing baseball, athlete. So you're right. He's, he's, a, he's a monster guy. Yep. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about football as well. I know you're a big Bears fan, so got some questions for you about the quarterback situation. You have time to hang out with us for one more segment, Jerry? I, I sure do. Absolutely. Fantastic. Okay, everybody, we have Jerry Hairston Jr. with us. We will take a quick commercial break, and we will come back, continue talking Dodger baseball, NFL, and everything else. Back in a moment. Your internet flagship station for sports, Voice America Sports. Life is complicated and sometimes we all need a little help, but don't have the time for a full hour-long session or don't know who to turn to. That's where BetterHelp comes into play. With BetterHelp, I can get matched with one of over 2,500 licensed and approved counselors and therapists and get help anytime, anywhere, totally private. For a flat weekly fee starting at $35, I can connect with my counselor via text, chat, video conference, or phone, which is great for me because I'm always on the go. And I can go back to previous sessions whenever I want through my secure account from anywhere in the world. It's a great feeling to know that help is there, affordable, private, and convenient to my schedule. We all can use a little help. Visit betterhelp.com forward slash VA health and register for free. You can try it for seven days without being charged on your credit card and get matched with a licensed counselor usually within 24 hours. Get better help today at betterhelp.com forward slash VA health. If you think you've seen online TV before, let us surprise you. VoiceAmerica.tv is online now. The leader in live Internet talk radio has done it again. Multiple channels, a state-of-the-art viewing experience, live and on-demand programs streaming 24 hours a day. It's exactly what you want, when you want it. VoiceAmerica.tv. From health and wellness to business, sports, and everything in between. Discover our new world. Visit VoiceAmerica.tv now and experience the future of online television. VoiceAmerica.tv. This is the Mike Abadir Show. If you want to call in today, we can be reached at 1-888-346-9144. That's 1-888-346-9144. Or send an email to Mike at the Show.com. Now, back to this week's program. We're talking baseball with Jerry Hairston Jr. from the Dodgers broadcast team. And we actually now have... My amazing co-host, Gino Bacola, he is back on with us. So let's pick up where we left off, Gino. 
We were just uh, talking yeah, about... Gary, Gary was cutting my mic, man. He didn't even want to give me any, any opportunity to come in and ask him some questions. I watched him at a home run in the old-timers game, too. I even was going to give him a... <laughs> I was going to give him some props you lost, for that. You lost but... me an old-timers game. It's called it's Legends. <laughs> legends. <laughs> that was a drive, man. You turned on that one. Yeah. yeah. You still got a little pop. Kind of cut, try to throw that 60-mile-an-hour slider down and in. Wasn't having it. Well, well, speaking of the lineup, we we hear a lot about some of these other really powerful lineups, and you guys talked about it a little bit in the first segment, Jerry. I mean, when, when we're talking about the Dodgers this year, there's been like a group of five that have really carried the team throughout the year. It was Turner, Seeger, Taylor, Bellinger, and Puig being so consistent. I mean, when you look at any team that's left now in the playoffs and, and you go through their top five in the batting order, I'd be willing to put the Dodgers' top five up against anyone else's. I agree, especially when they're healthy. You know, I know Corey Seeger's been banged up the last, two, last month or two months with that right elbow. Uh, and, you know, it has affected his, his fielding, but it's also affected his hitting. Uh, unable to drive the ball. I think those four or five days really will do him some good uh, leading up to game one, and hopefully he gets a little more strength with that right elbow so he can really extend and add more power. He is a huge key for the Dodgers' success. You need Corey Seager to be Corey Seager. You know, he's, in my opinion, the best shortstop in all of baseball when he's healthy, when he's 100%. I know the kid in Cleveland's pretty good too. Uh, but you're right. Dodgers' first five hitters uh, are, are one of the best. If it's not the best in all of baseball. That said, you know, who's going to hit fifth for the Dodgers? I don't know. If they go as is and Cody Bellinger is hitting fourth, if I'm the manager, I'm not pitching Cody Bellinger. I'm making somebody else beat me, especially with the righty on the mound. I think Walker is going to make that start. You know, I, I, what I would do, I would have Cody Bellinger hit third and have Justin Turner hit fourth. You go CT3, Seager, Bellinger, and then Justin Turner hitting fourth. For a couple reasons. You know Justin Turner has been there, done that in the postseason. He's, he he's, won't be in all. Not that Cody Bellinger won't, won't be. You know, he, he, he'll be fine. But you want to make sure you have your experienced guy who you know will perform in the postseason in the clutch like Justin Turner, making sure he protects a guy like Cody Bellinger because you want to make sure Cody Bellinger swings the bat. So if you have Justin Turner hitting third, Cody Bellinger fourth, I think they might go with Yasmati Grandal, who's a streaky hitter. When he has his hot streaks, he can be as good as anybody, but he also can have his cold streaks. If I'm a manager, I'm passing on Cody Bellinger, putting him on, and making a guy like Yasmati Grandal beat me. You know, let me ask you a question just in terms of the time gap between the very last game played and the start of the playoff series, which will be tomorrow night at Dodger Stadium, 7.30 p.m. Uh, will... Will the layoff hurt hurt the team? And and what is it that Dave Roberts will do during the days in between to keep the team loose, focused, fresh? And you know, baseball players are creatures of habit. They play every day basically for 162 days, and uh, timing is very key. So what will, what happens during during this stretch of time? And do you expect it to be an issue? Whereas the Diamondbacks just played a game yesterday. It it, it can be an issue. You know, it really can be an issue, and I think managers, what they did, what they do, and I know Dave Roberts have done this, they had a couple simulated games to kind of keep their competitive juices flowing. I know when I was with the, with the Yankees, we had a, a gray and white game. Uh, basically, the grays were the reserves, and then the whites were, were, were the starters. And what they would do is they would give the gray team, in the first thing, already a 3 nothing lead to kind of light a fire under the starters to say, you're already behind. You know, you're down three runs. Because sometimes the energy is tough to match in that first one or two innings when you've had that long layoff. You know, you've had a long five, what, five or six days. In a baseball season, that seems like two months. It's been a long time for the, since the Dodgers took the field. So you've got to make sure you match that intensity in that first inning because the Diamondbacks, having played a game last night, they're going to be up to speed uh, playing competitive base, baseball. So you've got to make sure you match that intensity from the very first pitch. Is it harder for the hitters or the pitchers? Uh, I would say it's harder for the hitters because guys like Clayton Kershaw are used to pitching on every fifth day, you know, having their turn in the rotation. For the hitters, you know, you want to make sure you see as much live during these four or five days, uh, those simulated games, to kind of match that intensity. So, uh, you know, hopefully they did that. 
uh, during these sim games. So they hit the ground running uh, in that first inning uh, of game one. Jerry, the Dodgers have lined up their rotation for uh, games one, two, and three. We know we're going to see Kershaw in game one. We know we're going to see Hill in game two and then Darvish in game three. A little disappointing for Alex Wood. He's had such a great year, but the Dodgers have such a deep rotation. They're trying to mat, uh, to set things up well. What circumstance do you, do you think we see Alex Wood in Game 4, and when do we not see Alex Wood in Game 4? What do you think it's going to come down to, to if we see him start in the series or if we see him come out of the pen? Well, well first of all, it's a brilliant move by the Dodgers because, you know, Alex Wood can pitch effectively out of the bullpen or as a starter, so if if the Dodgers are up 2-1 in the series or, or down 2-1 uh, in the series, Alex Wood will probably take the ball in game four. That being said, let's say Dodgers are up one game to none on the, on the D-backs in game two, uh, and it's an extra inning ball game. You know, you want to make sure you have a guy like Alex Wood who can pitch in that eighth, ninth, tenth inning, whatever, if it does go extra innings, to win that game two, and you can go up two games to none. And that gives you the luxury to maybe start Maeda on game four or Ryu on game four. It gives you so many different options. Uh, maybe start Kershaw on, on short rest in game four and do and have like a bullpen game if need be. You never know. You want as many options as possible in a short series. So right now, Alex Wood is the swing guy. He still can very much start game four. But you want to make sure you have all your options on the table. So I love the way the Dodgers have the rotation set. I think it was a brilliant move having Rich Hill pitch game two because the breaking ball is more effective uh, in a little bit of a heavy air at Dodger Stadium as, as opposed to light air in Arizona. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, when you're talking about rotation, I have to ask the obvious question, which is, and I don't want to dwell on it too much, but... Kershaw has had some postseason trouble in the past. What do you think has been the cause of that? And is that something where they look back at film and he's missing location-wise? Is the pressure getting to him? I can't imagine that be the, being the case for the best, you know, pitcher on the planet. So uh, well, first of all, is that just a fluky I'll, I'll, thing? No, it could be a little bit of a fluky thing. If you really look back on it, and if I'm scouting Clayton Kershaw, and I know Clayton very well, have been his team, been his teammate for two years, and play, played against him for a few years as well. It's been that one inning. You know, if you really go back, he's pitched very well, but the times really well. he's gotten hit, it's been that one inning. You know, where things kind of unraveled, and maybe because the Dodgers didn't trust their bullpen. You know, usually in, in the postseason. You know, a pitcher does well in the sixth, seventh inning. He's out of the game. And he gets, he gives, gets all the handshakes, and he pitched six innings. We gave I got two earned runs. Hey, great job, P- great performance. But because it's Clayton Kershaw, you expect him to, to go out and, and shut everybody down for nine straight innings. It doesn't happen all the time. You know, so it's been one inning, and usually it's that seventh inning, and I think one time it's been that eighth inning that has given him trouble. And, and first of all, he is not scared of anything. Uh, he is one of the most uh, fierce competitors. He comes at you. He attacks. And I think once, I think sometimes he may be a little tired pitching on short rest. And instead of that curveball having that great bite, you know, in that seventh, eighth inning, it, 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 it hangs up there in the plate and where he gets hit, hit around. So I think, you know, being successful last year coming in, pitching well as a starter, and then coming in and closing out game five of the NLDS where he pitched extremely well, I think he got over that hump. And I expect him to pitch even better this postseason. Thank you, Jerry. I was trying to tell Mike earlier that the numbers were a little, little, little worse. People talk about the numbers worse than they really are. He's actually had yeah. four awesome starts where he's given up one run or less. He came in last year and got the save. And, you know, one thing they don't talk about, we ask so much of him. A lot of these times he's coming back on short rest in games that are super pressure-packed. Last year he pitched October 7th, 11th, 13th, and 16th. He was yeah. pitching every Ridiculous. few days. He pitched 101, 110, 7, and, and then 84 pitches within you know an eight-day span when many pitchers throw one time during that, during that spurt. And, and, I think and we're that's why see you have a guy like Kershaw. Alex Wood and Kent Maeda in that bullpen that, for that reason. You do not want to tax Clayton Kershaw anymore. You I mean, have got so yeah. much from him the last four or five years, which has been ridiculous. So you make sure you have guys like Kenta Maeda in that bullpen and Alex Wood in that bullpen just in case. Because if he gives you six shutout innings and he's starting to run out of gas, 
then you put in a Kenta Maeda for maybe two innings or an Alex Wood for two innings and then give the ball to either Moore on the eighth uh, or and then obviously Kenley Jansen in the ninth. That's a fantastic analysis. We're joined by Jerry Harrison Jr. of the Dodgers broadcast team with Access Sportsnet LA talking about the Dodgers and about the playoffs. And before we ask him his thoughts on the Chicago Bears quarterback situation, a couple more questions about the Dodgers, and then we'll ask him to make some playoff picks for the other series and and his takes on the American League as well. But let me ask you about one of my favorite Dodgers, Adrian Gonzalez. Is there any chance that we will see him this series? I know they've already said that he's likely out for the entire playoffs. And from a leadership perspective, you know, um, he brings a lot to the table, obviously. You know, who are going to be some of the other guys, especially, you know, from the position players who will step up and, and take charge in the absence of, of, of Aegon? Well, obviously, it's a big blow uh, losing Adrian Gonzalez. And no, he won't be back uh, for this season. Uh, his back is just too messed up. And, you know, I got a chance to see him and I asked him how he was doing. This about maybe a week to 10 days ago. And the look he gave me was I can see the pain in his face. And I've been there. I've had uh, similar back stuff, and it's just debilitating. You cannot swing the bat. You can't move. And especially in the postseason, you do not want to be uh, out there on that field and, and really hurting your ball club because physically you can't do anything about it. So he won't be back this year. And, you know, missing him is huge because, you know, even though the power isn't there, you know when he's held – or, excuse me, the power hasn't really been there this year – when he has been relatively healthy, he's been great with runners in scoring position. And you know you're going to get a good at-bat when he's healthy uh, in the postseason because he has postseason experience. But you know what? Other teams are going to feel sorry for us. You've got to make sure you find a way uh, to win ball games. Guys like Andre Ethier, or Curtis Granison, those two guys have, big, uh, have, have, have had postseason experience. Chase Utley has had postseason experience. So a lot of the young guys are going to rely on those veteran guys to uh, get them through uh, some difficult times. You may be down in a series, whether it's this series, if you advance next series, where you got to make sure you get a little tougher, find a way to win. And uh, I think the Dodgers have a really good mixture of veteran guys and young guys. Uh, but all it comes down to it really is you got to be playing your best baseball. The D-backs seems like, seem like they're playing really good baseball right now, and the Dodgers need to, uh, to match their intensity and, and their play. You know, speaking of the young guys, Bellinger has had arguably the best rookie season in National League history from a hitter, and Judge, the same in the American League. Is this maybe one of the best rookie, you know, rookie of the year tandems that we've ever seen? Wow. I I would, I would, whew. Judge and Bellinger. I mean, I, I would say yes. I mean, maybe I, I believe wasn't Trout and Harper weren't they rookies at the same time? They were rookies at the same time, but I think Trout, even though he had a fantastic season, I mean, I think it was still like you know sixteen, eighteen, maybe twenty home runs yeah. or something like that. Not historic, record-breaking numbers in each yeah. league and in baseball history. Yeah, you're right. I, you'd have to you'd have to say yes. I mean, the the way that these two guys have really put the baseball world on notice. Aaron Judge has been much CTV, uh, not just in New York, but really entire entire baseball world. And Cody Bellinger has matched him stride for stride. And, you know, really, Cody kind of spotted Aaron Judge a month. He missed three weeks of, of the, the beginning of the season being in AAA, and he missed about 10 days being on the DL. So these two guys have been electric for their ball clubs. They're fun to watch. Uh, for what I've heard, you know, you know, listening to Joe Girardi and a couple of guys I know with the Yankees, he's every bit of Derek Jeter, you know, but with more power. And I'm going to say better looking than Derek Jeter too. Uh, <laughs> you know, he just has that has that it factor, you know, has that it factor. I know Derek had it, you know, loves the big stage, you know, he knows all eyes are on him, and not only does he not shy from it, performs extremely well. Now, Aaron has a long way to go to max Derek Jeter's rings and, and, and performance in the postseason. But you can just tell, you know, Aaron loves that spotlight. You saw how he performed uh, during, the All-Star, uh, during the All-Star week when he won the home run derby. So, you know, Aaron has that, that, that it factor like Derek has. And, and Cody Bellinger, who was around Derek Jeter growing up as a kid, 
because his father Clay played for the New York Yankees. He's got that it factor, you know. So he loves that big stage. He's not shook by by any means. Uh, playing in L.A., playing in a huge market, playing in Hollywood, you know, he seems to love and thrive uh, under the big lights. And uh, I think playing in the postseason is going to be fun for Cody Bellinger. Absolutely. Well, we got a couple minutes left with Jerry Hairston Jr. of the Dodgers broadcast Mikey, team with X. Let's go prediction. Yep, that's exactly where I was going to go with it. We've got an emailer, Steve from Malibu, and he's asking for Jerry's playoff prediction. So let's just run down the list, Jerry. Uh, Boston and Houston. Oh, man. Houston. Wow, that, that's a tough one. Boston, you know, they, they can they can score runs. I love Mookie Betts. Handley Ramirez has postseason experience. They're a really good team, but that said, you go Verlander game one. I know he's going, I believe he's going against Chris Sale. Has to be going against Chris Sale. Yep. Um, and then you got game two, Keiko. Well, wow, I'm going to pick Houston Astros. You know, a lot going on in that city. You know, they were devastated by the by the hurricane. I think they're going to have a lot of emotion. Uh, You're breaking my heart, Jerry. Uh, breaking I, I'm, my I know. Heart. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I got to go Astros in that one. And you just about, talked about Judge. Is uh, is he going to be able to help the Yankees get by Cleveland, who's been one of the best teams we've seen ever over the last couple months in the history of baseball? They look really, really tough. The Yankees. They might be might be a year away, Jerry. They might be like the Cubs of a few years ago, where they're they're getting their playoff experience right now. Uh, I, I kind of agree with you on that. And you know, at the start of the year, I picked the Dodgers and the Indians to represent you know the National League and the American League in the World Series. But I have to pick an upset somewhere. There's going to be an upset, okay? And I can't believe I'm saying this because right now, on paper, the Cleveland Indians are the best team in baseball. I, in my opinion, they're the best team. They, they have a great bullpen. They got really good starters. Uh, they got a, a lineup top down. They're very good. But I think starting Trevor Bauer in Game One give the Yankees hope. If they win Game One, and obviously Corey Kluber is nasty, that'll be a tough, tough get in Game Two. But if they get if they win Game One, you know they go even in, in, in that series going in the Bronx. They got a couple veteran guys in in Sabathia and and Tanaka that aren't afraid of the postseason, too. So I'm going to pick the Yankees to win that I get I get uh, I like upset. it, too. Upset alert. You heard it here first. Jerry Harrison Jr. predicting the biggest upset in the playoffs. Jerry, we got 30 seconds, so can you give us a quick pick on the Chicago Cubs and Washington National Series? Yeah, who's and then playing the Dodgers? Let- we know they're playing the Dodgers. Who's going to be against the Dodgers? Yeah, oh, okay. exactly. Well, uh, right, exactly. Right and then now, leave us the with... And then- the Nationals, oh, their offensive firepower are too good. I'm going to pick the Nationals. The Cubs starting pitching a struggle this year. And I'm going to say the Dodgers beat the D-backs in five games. It's going to be a, a, a knock them out drag them out series. It's going to be a tough, tough series. Dodgers win in five. Very good. And then leave us with this thought. Who should be the quarterback for the Bears moving forward? Mitch Trubisky, without question, he needs to be the quarterback. He has a chance. He'll be starting Monday night, and hopefully he – plays as good as Watson, the kid in Houston's playing right now. That would be fantastic. Jerry, this has gone by so fast, but you've been absolutely incredible. You brought it big with your playoff analysis, Dodgers insight, and everything else. We thank you so much. We will retweet the on-demand out for everybody who didn't get a chance to listen. Please tune in and, and, and listen and watch Access Sportsnet LA for the pre- and post-game shows and we have a lot of Dodgers fan listening, so I'm going to go yeah, ahead and say, go Dodgers. Time too. Do, do me a favor. I like it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jerry. No problem. No problem. We'll take care. We'll talk soon. All right, take care. All right. Okay, guys, we'll have one more segment coming up, and we will be right back after this short commercial message. Internet flagship station for sports. Voice America Sports. I'm busy and so is my family. Leftover pizza and unhealthy takeout isn't really doing it for us anymore. Just ask my bathroom scale. That all changed when I found Freshly. 
For less than $10 a meal, Freshly delivers six meals a week, always fresh, never frozen, prepared by top chefs and nutritionists using the best, freshest, gluten-free ingredients. The best part is the menu is always new and fresh, just like the food, and it only takes three minutes for me to prepare breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and there's no messy cleanup and no dishes. My family loves the choices and the taste and freshly delivers to my home and my office so I eat healthy all day, every day. If you're tired of the same old cardboard delivery and takeout, try out Freshly.com today and save $20 on your first order using coupon code VAH639 at Freshly.com. Your taste buds and your scale will thank you. So save 20 bucks today with coupon code VAH639 at Freshly.com. Have you friended us on Facebook yet? Why not? Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for the keywords Voice America. Once you are part of our Facebook network, you'll receive daily messages about what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and new happenings of the Voice America Talk Radio Network. And you can add your voice to the always active discussions on our wall. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for Voice America. This is the Mike Abadir Show. If you want to call in today, we can be reached at 1-888-346-9144. That's 1-888-346-9144. Or send an email to Mike at the themikeabadirshow.com. Now, back to this week's program. Man, wasn't that tremendous? Jerry brought it big time, man. I love talking baseball with Jerry Harrison Jr. We thank him for coming on board. For the last segment here, we want to talk analysis on the NFL and a little bit of horse racing as well. But before we do that, just a reminder that you could always reach us through the call-in number, which you just heard, 1-888-346-9144. Visit us at www.themikeabadeershow.com, Twitter at Mike Abadier. Twitter, it's me, Gino B., Gino, why don't you tell us about your horse racing selections for this upcoming Saturday at Santa Anita? Yeah, and for everyone listening to, um, just subscribe on the podcast. Click on, on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, anywhere you, they have your podcast. If you go subscribe, you'll get all of our shows immediately sent to you. And if you can just take a few seconds to go over and give us a five-star rating, literally will take you two seconds. You click the five stars. If you have an extra ten seconds, you can write a little... Uh, message about what you like about the show we love the feedback uh, we want to make sure that um we're uh we're doing everything to uh, to keep the fans out there and the listeners happy got a uh, horse for you hopefully a winner in the fifth at santa anita on saturday or juice or juice mandela and pratt this course debuted got a little action didn't run poorly and i'm just expecting a much better effort the horse kind of had a slow start was in tight was in between lost a few lengths couldn't re-rally gets a little more distance to work with down the hill i like aura juice the five in the fifth at Santa Anita on Saturday. So make sure to get to the windows there. But we've got to go rapid fire, Mikey, so we can hit most of these, uh, most of these football games. I've got a few games that I like this weekend thinking about playing, and I'll kind of start with the first one. Um, I'm going to go Pats Tampa. That's the Thursday night game. That's tonight. New England has a legendarily bad defense. They are currently allowing 32 points a game. They're second in points allowed right now in the NFL. Tampa's banged up a little bit. A couple backers out. I like the over in this game, Mike. Uh, I'm going to go over 54 and a half. That's going to be the play for me in the Thursday night game. Over, Paps, Tampa, 54 and a half. Sounds good. What about San Diego? Are they going to win a game? They're at the New York Giants. This is a great game because somebody's got to win. You know, and what's funny is this is two 0-4 teams who, at the beginning of the season, people thought could have been playoff teams. Um, if you can get this line at Chargers plus three and a half, my analysis for this game isn't really anything about, um, you know, who's the better team. It's just, I think these are two mediocre teams, and I don't think either team should be favored by more than a field goal. So I think if it's going to be three points, you take the three points, you take the Chargers. If it's three and a half, you take the Chargers. If it's two and a half, I don't like the game. I don't want to play it. But if it's three, if you get that field goal, you take the Chargers. I just think this, this screams like a game that's going to come down to, <laughs> comes down to the last drive and one team kick a game-winning field goal. Yeah, no doubt. What about, let's move on to uh, a few other matchups. What are your thoughts on Buffalo at Cincinnati? 
Yeah, this is an interesting game because the Bills are three and one right now. Um, they just beat Atlanta on the road. They are coached very well. They run the ball. They have a solid tight end. They have uh, Tyrod Taylor who can scramble and pick up first downs. Very good defense. They've only allowed 54 points right now through four games. That's the lowest in the league. At the Bills are three-point uh, underdogs on the road against Cincinnati. The Bengals have been much better in the last two games since they made the change in offensive coordinator. We've seen A.J. Green get involved uh, a lot more. They're coming off a win. But I just think the Bills are the better team. So I'm going to take the Bills here plus the three, and I would also play this game money line with the Bills straight up to beat the Bengals on the road. Good stuff, Gino. We have a matchup of the Birds, the Cardinals, two and two, <laughs> at the Philadelphia Eagles, three and one. What are your thoughts? Eagles. Eagles are six and a half point favorites. The Cardinals are just bad right now, honestly. They've, ever since David Johnson got hurt, they have a couple uh, injuries on the offensive line. Um, Carson Palmer, he's, he's kind of Jekyll and Hyde right now. For me, it's the Eagles minus the six and a half. If you get seven, anything more than seven, I don't like it. But if you can get up, if you can get up to a touchdown with the Eagles, I think you take it right there. Um, as far as the Cardinals are concerned, a couple interesting fantasy plays. If John Brown isn't in the game, you might want to use Jerron Brown. Also, Andre Ellington catching a lot of passes out of the backfield. He's very good in PPR formats. These guys might not be necessarily great. NFL real-time players, but they're good fantasy players, and they'll, they'll be able to get you some points this weekend. One of the best matchups this weekend features the Panthers and Lions. Uh, both interesting teams. The Lions easily could have been 4-0. They probably should be 4-0 because they got robbed. And the Panthers, their first two wins of the season were pretty ugly. They didn't really tell us a lot about how good of a team they, they are. Then they got their butts whipped by the Saints at home, and it kind of looked like that first two games that they won were maybe, you know, kind of uh, fluffed, if you will, because of the opponents that they, you know, that they played and beat, and they didn't really look exceptionally well against the 49ers. But then they come back and absolutely destroy New England. I know the score was close, but, I mean, they really had that game uh, firmly in hand. Now they go to Detroit. Interesting matchup. Probably one of the better matchups of the weekend. Yeah, I, I like the Lions in here. I think the Panthers' big game last week was more an indictment on the New England defense than it was on the Panthers' offense. Remember, they're still missing Greg Olson. We really haven't seen McCaffrey break out yet. That was Cam's best game by far. He was running the ball a lot more, so i like to see that. Kelvin Benjamin's banged up. We don't know if we'll see him. I think Devin Funches is a very good fantasy play this weekend. He's been getting um, a lot of targets, and he had a couple touchdowns last week. But I, I like the Lions. They're tenth in scoring defense and fourth in uh, they're tenth in scoring offense and fourth in scoring defense. We're the only teams in the top ten in both. They should be four zero, as you mentioned. Stafford has not turned the ball over much. Seven touchdowns and just one pick. And this team is plus nine in turnover differential. I like the Lions in here. I don't think much of the Panthers right now. So I'm taking the Lions minus two and a half or minus three. Um, those are good. If you get to three and a half, I don't want to take it. But anything, a field goal or under, I'm taking the Lions. And another interesting matchup in that we've seen one team really, really improve quite a bit. And another team, I don't know what I make of them, especially offensively. And I'm talking about the Seattle Seahawks. You know, they're two and two, um, but they haven't been the Seattle Seahawks that we know of in terms of, you know, a defense that you can absolutely rely on. And it's evident that Marshawn Lynch really made that offense go. Now they go to an upstart Rams team who just came off a huge win. This might be an early must win for the Seahawks. I know it's, Tough to say that in, in week five, but if they go to two and three, the Rams go to four and one, Rams will be sitting in a pretty good position. What do you make of this ball game? This is the biggest pro football game in L.A. in 25 years, 30 years. I mean, I mean it's, it's only the fourth week of the season, but the Rams are three and one. They are playing like a different team. They could go up if the Cardinals lose and they end up beating Seattle, they could go up by a couple games in the division already. They're scoring the most points in the league through four games, 35.5 points per game. The only problem with the Rams so far is they're allowing 26.3, which is 28th in the league. I do think they are a, a pretty good offense right now, and you know, coach of the year in the first four games has to be one of the Shawns, McVay or uh, uh, McDermott. They've both been excellent. So I, I'm going to play the Rams-Seattle game, but I, I'm... I'm 
I think the Rams win this game. I think it's going to be close. I'm going over. Um, Seattle rushed last week for 194 yards. The Rams have been allowing a ton on the ground. Todd Gurley is one of the early season MVPs. He's touching the ball a ton. I just think they're going to go up and down in this game. The over-under is 47. I'm taking the over in here. You know, uh, Seattle's been a little unlucky with their running back situation. Lacey Rawls, Carson Proceis, and now McKissick. He might be the DFS play. They've had to go through a lot of running backs early on in this year already. So uh, I'm going to go over in this game. I think they're going up and down over 47. I'm going to get a little bit out of my comfort zone here. Are you ready for this? I'm actually going to give yep. out a pick. I'm going okay. to give out my one lock of the week. Okay. And that's in the Packers-Cowboys matchup. My lock of the week, Dallas Cowboys. You like the Cowboys are two-and-a-half-point favorites right now. They're playing the Packers. Uh, I actually like the over in this game. The, the over and under is 52-and-a-half. You know, the Cowboys' defense has been bad. They played the Rams last week, and, uh, and the Rams just – they – they scored all over them. Uh, the Packers are a little bit banged up, and I think if they don't have Ty Montgomery, even if they do have him, he's probably not going to be playing uh, at 100%. I think they're going to be throwing the ball a lot. So I expect this game to go back and forth and back and forth. Um, I think it's going to be tight, but I, I'm playing the over in here again, over 52.5. So I like a couple overs today and a couple of uh, uh, spreads, um, but this is another over that will be going over 52.5. And, and the Mike drop Mike Locke of the week. He likes the Cowboys. Absolutely. Take it to the bank, guys. Let's talk about a few other games that maybe aren't as sexy of a matchup on paper, but might be pretty good, um, you know, wagering opportunities, fantasy opportunities, etc. Maybe if we could go down this list and save a couple of minutes at the end for our baseball predictions as well. Let's start with the Jets at the Broncos. Uh, Jets and Browns. The, the Broncos have a bye this week. Uh, the Jets are at the Browns. The Browns are actually favored in this game. I think main, the main takeaways from this game, we're probably going to see Miles Garrett playing for the first time. Duke Johnson in PPR scoring. He's had five, six, seven, and ten targets each week. He's a very good back to use um, in fantasy for the Jets. When there's no Matt Forte, that means Bilal Powell will play. And Austin Zafarian Jenkins, he's a good tight end to use. He's had ten targets uh, over the last couple weeks with nine catches. Um, another game, Mike, the Jags, Steelers. I'm not really too interested in this game. The Steelers have been a little bit disappointing so far, but they're still 3-1. and one. They finally started to run the ball last week. I think this is a big bell game. He had 35 carries last week. I think they're just going to run the ball against the Jaguars, who have a good secondary, but a bad front seven as far as against the run. So uh, I'm going to go with the Steelers um, and Bell as a play in fantasy uh, in this one. Do the Dolphins pull the plug on Cutler if they don't beat the t- Tennessee Titans? Yeah, I don't see why not. If he doesn't, if they don't win this weekend, I mean, they were shut out in London a week after scoring a touchdown on the last play of the game. Remember, they could easily be 0-3. If Koo doesn't miss the field goal in, uh, in the Chargers game, they would be 0-3. What's nice is uh, you get with, with, with Landry and Parker, I think you have good floors for fantasy targets, but uh, uh, Jai worries me a little bit. Um, Tennessee, they're going to probably have Matt Castle starting. I would steer clear of a lot of their fantasy players because we just don't know if Mariota is going to be in the game or not. He's day-to-day with the hamstring. We've hit our two-minute warning here, so let's just give uh, give out winners. Only winners, Gino. No losers. Yep. SF at Indy. Uh, 49ers, Colts. The Colts are going to win this game. It's going to be close. And then the Ravens play the Raiders. Uh, we, we heard Raider barking a little bit earlier on. I, he's not very happy with the way the Raiders are playing, but I still think even with E.J. Manuel, the Raiders can win this game. The Ravens have been bad. Chiefs-Texans, Mikey, uh, I'm going to go to the Chiefs. They do look like one of the better teams, but why, I think they're going to keep it close. So keep, keep an eye on that line, and I think you play the Texans on the line. Vikings-Bears is a tough one because it's going to be Trubinsky, and we still don't know if we're going to see Keenum or Bradford and Dalvin Cooks out. So that game I'm just going to steer clear of. That's a Monday night game. We don't know a lot about it yet. Give me your World Series matchup. Uh, I think the World Series is going to be the Indians versus the Dodgers. I think it's going to be Dodgers versus the Nationals. I think it's going to be Indians versus the Astros. In my opinion, those are the four best teams this year. I think they've been the four best teams all throughout the year. They have the four best pitching staff. They have the four best uh, bullpens. They have the four best all-around teams, batting lineups. Um, I think they're just the, the, the deepest team. So it's going to be Dodgers over the Indians, seven games in the World Series. Not so fast, my friend. The Boston Red Sox have Chris Sale, and they got the best closer in the game in Kimbrell. 
I think they win that series against Houston. I think the Yankees put up uh, a, a major fight against the Indians, but the Indians pull it off. Uh, I agree with you that the Nationals are going to take down the defending champs in the Cubs. And I do believe that it's going to be a fantastic series, but the Dodgers are going to prevail over the Diamondbacks. Ultimately, though, I'd love to see the Red Sox and the Dodgers coast-to-coast World Series. My prediction is the Nationals and the Indians. That's where I stand. Okay. Well, I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. You know, but let's, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we'll see. We'll see where things are at by this same time next week. We thank everybody for joining and listening to us. We thank Jerry Hairston Jr. We've got a great episode coming up for you guys next week. We will release all the details on Twitter and on social media. Have a wonderful afternoon and enjoy the playoffs. Take care, everybody. Thanks for joining us this week for the Mike Abadir Show. Please tune in again next Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time and 11 a.m. Pacific Time for another show with Mike and his co-host, Gino Bacola, on the Voice America Sports Channel. Have a great week.